I'm really happy to be here for several reasons. First of all, it's nice to see some old friends and hopefully make some new friends here. And and uh, really pleased. I'm, I'm relatively new to the Canberra group, but very excited about some of the technology that uh, that uh, we're working with and we're going to talk about today. Really like to make this. I'll just work it out off of here. I find. Um, I'd like to make this really interactive. I, I'm from California. I'm uh, the chief of the spine group at the University of California, San Francisco. We've got a, a pretty big group of neurosurgeons, orthopedic surgeons. We work together uh, in a uniquely cooperative way. Um, having said that, being from California, I, I also I consider this my, my home. I grew up in, in Princeton, and I spent a lot of time here on the Schuylkill River. I rode, rode uh, with, with the U.S. team here uh, on, on Schuylkill for, for many summers. And, and uh, so it's really nice to be, be uh, here in Philadelphia. And again, be, being with all of you is terrific. Uh, just by way of disclosures, I um, get some, some research support from the NIH and other places. I, I don't take any honoraria for anything anymore. I'm, I'm part of the NAS Board of Directors, so I don't uh, get paid anything for being here. I'm just, just happy to be here with all of you. Uh, I am working with Canberra on uh, one of their new anterior antibody devices, but don't, uh, don't receive anything on that. Um, so with that as a background, what I want to talk about this morning is just antibody fusions broadly. So the topic for this section is going to be on anterior uh, and posterior and uh, the advantages and disadvantages of each. And I want to talk a little more broadly with some historical background, and I'll keep a bit of an eye out on the time. Actually, Michael, just give me a cut when you're ready. <laughs> but I'm, going to, I'm just going to talk about uh, where, where I actually really favor the idea of having the flexibility to be able to work uh, the antibody space from front or back. I think in broad categories, we all recognize that there's some cost effectiveness and some durability to getting a circumferential fusion versus a posterior lateral fusion. And we're all familiar with some literature that suggests that, indeed, in many instances, we'll talk about degenerative spondylolisthesis later, but for, for a lot of degenerative pathology, it's hard to show an effect size of a circumferential fusion versus a posterior lateral. But, um, uh, we we uh, know from some of the work done by Christensen and, and others in uh, uh, Scandinavia that indeed the durability of our outcomes are better when we go circumferentially. And the question becomes, how do we get to a circumferential fusion? And, and what I think is awfully important here is not to be myopic about this, and this is uh, the article by Ralph Mobbs that many are familiar with, but, but recognizing that there's different indications for different angles to the spine. And I probably use each of these almost equally, and I'll show you examples where I prefer. Uh, uh, I rarely am using a plif now. I'm usually going transframinal when I'm going posterior, but I often go direct lateral through the psoas. And you know whether I'm going direct lateral or anterior to the psoas, often that depends on where I am in the spine, right? So sometimes if I'm up a little bit higher, I might be going more direct lateral. If I'm down lower, I might be going more anosoas. And then. Uh, I still think the ALIF has got a really important role in my hands. So, you know, again, a lot of variation in how we manage uh, getting to the antibody space. And the emphasis that I'm going to make is that we shouldn't be myopic about this, but really have the ability to actually approach the spine through that full spectrum, through that full, you know, what I call a, a 180, if not a 360. Putting this in a historical context, I just want to uh, recognize uh, the work of Ralph Cloward uh, in, in uh, introducing the PLIF. And you know, this was back in 1947. And I thought that this quote, uh, John Dimar gave, this, gave me this, but I thought it was quite an interesting quote. Is what he said is uh, the ideal uh, mechanically of the PLIF is to have a single operation that restores the antibody space and um, that opens the disc height and restores the inner body space. And his description of the, of the, uh, of, of the mechanism of the plif, there it is, uh, and having strong, in, in his case, wedge draft, he was, he was using actually in some cases coral, uh, in some cases allograft, but a strong wedge draft to hold that space open. And, and here's where really what, what his plifs uh, uh, looked like, was a spinous processes cut and, and actually uh, placed into the inner body space. You see there almost intentionally maybe with some uh, some subsidence, but you know there's some significant complications with this in terms of graft migration, potential for neural injuries, non-unions, and then you know Jurgen Harms introduced uh, what I'm doing more often now is more of a transfrontal antibody approach, and uh, and that works out well with regard to safety around the neural elements. But but having said that, some limitations there too, and I call this the the paradox of the TLIF, which is on the one hand you want to get your cages up anterior to try and optimize your segmental lordosis, and on the other hand you can't really compress across that TLIF cage without being at risk of uh, of, of narrowing down that neural foramen. 
So the idea of trying to restore lordosis and keeping the foramen open can be a bit of a paradox. And you know, I, I, this is an older paper, but Todd Albert uh, here in Philadelphia put this together looking at a series of his consecutive T-lifts, and he was just as likely to create segmental kyphosis as he was to create lordosis. And probably a lot of it has to do with the, the cage size and shape and how you put the cage. And Neil Anon showed us that when we put a cage up anteriorly, we can actually really fulcrum over that cage. And a, a big part of getting segmental lordosis is going to be to take out our inner spinous ligaments, to take out the facet joints widely. And you can fulcrum over a well-placed cage. I'll just show you that maybe as an example here. This is a patient I revised um, uh, some time ago now, but uh, this is a uh, a woman who had a, a post-laminectomy deformity. And uh, you can see here she had an ALIF at L5S1. And at that time, they had a, a vascular injury. It was done in another hospital. And um, I wasn't terribly enthusiastic about going back in the front. You see on a CT scan, maybe you know a little bit of vacuum disc there. I always say when I see a vacuum disc on a CT scan, that that's an invitation for me to put something in the inner body space. Um, <clears throat> But in this instance, my, my actual plan was to do an extended PSO at um, L4, so get into the 3-4 disc, and then do a T-lift at 4-5. And, uh, and this is what happened on, on, on the table is I was, I was working that space and um, doing my facetectomies, put screws in. And then with my T-lift, I was able to, um, <coughs> I think I'll be able to show you this. I was able to actually release the ALL with that T-lift and really get a pretty, uh, pretty dramatic correction. Uh, segmentally there, both in the coronal plane and the sagittal plane. So um, from a posterior approach, in some instances, if you really do a, an aggressive PT lift, you can fulcrum over that cage and actually even open the ALL. So I was able to get good correction in the coronal plane with just some uh, type 2 osteotomies. And then in the sagittal plane, really get uh, you know about 20, 25 degrees of segmental lordosis with a T lift. The point there being that you know, we can get uh, segmental lordosis uh, effectively with a T-lift, but it, it can be tricky. And in, in general, uh, most of the time, if I really want to create lordosis, the T-lift isn't going to be my first approach. Uh, again, you can do it technically, but it, most of the time I'm going to do something more in the anterior column. So again, going back to history, this is where, uh, where Mercer from Scotland had written that, you know, the ideal operation for fusion of the spine would be an inner body fusion, right? To get to the inner body space would give us our structural support. And, uh, but the surgical difficulties, this is back in 1936, encountered in doing this make this technically impossible. Well, well that impossibility actually uh, was made possible, and I'll, I'll credit the work, not going through too much of the history here, I'll credit the work of, of, uh, in Hong Kong, right, by Hodgkin and Stock. So uh, basically, basically an orthopedic surgeon working together with a thoracic surgeon to treat tuberculosis. And, uh, and a classic example, taking care of kyphotic deformity uh, uh, through a thoracotomy. Um, so anterior surgery, I think, is, is really a valuable uh, surgery in my practice. And specifically, when we think about the challenge of trying to create lordosis. And lordosis is such an important part. Uh, we recognize in the swab classification, trying to match our pelvic incidence to our lumbar lordosis. I think most of you are now familiar with uh, some of the work that we've done with the, the GAP score, uh, so the Global Alignment and Proportion score. And, and just briefly, for those of you who might not be as familiar, recognizing that we really want to have about two-thirds of our lordosis from L4 to S1. So whether we're dealing with degenerative pathology or deformity, so often uh, creating lordosis from L4 to S1 is important. It's important to avoid adjacent segment problems. And this is where, in my hands, I think the anterior column uh, reconstruction is, is so powerful uh, to be able to really try and get that ratio so uh, the, the proportion score is, is basically, uh, it's a distribution of lordosis. We think that from L4 to S1, we want two-thirds of our lordosis to be uh, in that lower lumbar spine. And I'll show you some examples of what happens when that doesn't go right. So here's an example of a patient I treated recently. Uh, had prior laminectomy complicated by a DVT, so you see a filter in there. And that's always a bad sign when you see that on a pre-op film, you know? <laughs> the worst sign when you see that on a post-op film, that it wasn't there pre-op. But anyway, this is a patient who's got a you know, two-level spondyl uh, really no lordosis from L4 to S1. And, uh, and this is a case where, in my hands, you know, prior laminectomy, I'm not in love with the idea of, of, of doing a two-level T-lift on this. I'm not going get, to get much lordosis out of this. So this is one that I think in my hands, going front and back on this really works, works quite well. 
uh, for a, a segmental restoration of lordosis from L4 to S1. And then what about when it doesn't go well? So this is a, a patient uh, who, who I saw with these short films, and, and this, this patient had a prior fusion, 4 to 1. You see there's a degenerative spondy there at 4 5. But what, what I think is important to point out here is, is the lo absolute lack of lordosis from L4 to S1, but in this case, somebody who's fused without lordosis from 4 to 1. And this ends up becoming a really disabling pathology because when you're flat in those segments, what ends up happening is reliably the adjacent segment has to do a lot more work. And this is some work that was done, uh, there was a series of articles published in, Euro, uh, in a European spine journal, I think are worth, worth citing here, but when we don't do a good job from L4 to S1, when we don't restore two-thirds of our lordosis, uh, especially in patients with a high pelvic incidence, there's a really high incidence of adjacent segment problems there. And, and uh, Min Ka, or Khan Min from, uh, from Zurich in, in, in uh, Switzerland showed this, and he sh said that you know, when we do a good job, when we get two-thirds of our lordosis from L4 to S1, there's, there's still an adjacent level uh, uh, degeneration or revision surgery problem, but it's three times higher when we fuse four to one flat. So this, is, you know, this, this gap ratio, this restoration of lordosis isn't a problem that's unique to deformity. This is something that in our, in our regular degenerative pathology, we really need to pay attention to. So I think I'm gonna uh, give you an example of, of this again. This is a patient 59 years old, pain in a uh, L5 distribution, non-operative care for some period of time. Um, um, <clears throat> Okay, we'll, we'll go with this case. This is what I was thinking of, but this, this is fine too. So this is a, a patient who's got a, a, a spinal optosis, and uh, what you see here is, uh, you know, the, the typical findings of a, a spinal optosis, um, or a, a high-grade spinal lysis, I'll call it. It's really not a spinal optosis, but a high-grade spinal lysis of L5 on S1, and you see here on the, on the CT scan some doming of the sacrum. Uh, you see some real narrowing, and this is what I want to point out as I think I got an MRI scan to show you how narrow uh, that L5 uh, foramen is here. And, and this is a case where our, our part of our goal is to uh, restore lordosis, part of our goal is to really open up that L5 uh, neural foramen. And, and quite honestly, in my hands, most of the time, I actually do this uh, from a posterior approach. So most of the time, I'll do this with a, with a T-lift. I'll actually dome off the top of the sacrum. I can show you lots of examples where I've done that. But, but recently, I've actually done some of these with an anterior approach, um, and, and this has been a particularly effective approach as well. I'll just show you what I did in this case. This is actually a, a woman. I think she was uh, in her late 40s, early 50s or so. But she, um, uh, I, I, I went anteriorly, and I, I took my osteotome, and I took a little bit of the lip of L5 off the bottom, and then um, uh, I secured an inner body cage here to the L5 vertebra. And I, I use my cage inserter to push that cage back and, and then lock it in place anteriorly. And you can see here how, how dramatically that, that reduces the olisthesis as well as opens up that space for the neural foramen. And then, then I lock that in, all in uh, in the back. And so that's an example of restoring lordosis uh, using, using an ALIF. Um, one of the things that, that we did there, or that I, I meant to demonstrate, is the fact that that L5 foramen was so crushed preoperatively uh, in that high-grade uh, spinal lysis. And then the question is, how effectively are we decompressing that foramen with an anterior approach? Now, I'm looking forward to hearing from others about this. I can tell you that I'm a little bit of a skeptic about how effective that is. I tend to do my front and backs all the same day, um, but this is a group of my colleagues. Um, uh, Dean Chow was the lead on this, and Praveen Mumanani was part of this, and then some guys from, from Michigan as well. But uh, they, they took a look at uh, how well do we um, d indirectly decompress by what they did is they actually staged patients. So they did uh, one to three level L lifts and, and A lifts. And uh, what they said is if the VAS score for the leg pain improved by more than 50%, then they would actually just go percutaneously in the back. Whereas if it didn't improve by 50%, then they'd actually open up and decompression in the back. And it turned out that, two th that almost three quarters of the time, they had to decompress in the back. And, and I know maybe Izzy's gonna argue with me, but, and others gonna argue with you, John, you got, a lot of you guys believe in the indirect decompression, but in, in my hands, most of the time, I'm going in the back. And I can tell you in these high-grade spinal lysis cases uh, and, and patients with severe stenosis, I, I'm seeing some 
pretty significant, uh, uh, I'm doing some significant decompression still in the back. So I don't have a lot of faith in the indirect decompression on its own. And, and others will present another uh, perspective on that. But I'll just show you this as an example. So this is a patient who uh, had come to me uh, with, with a prior circumferential fusion of 4-5. That was solid and developed uh, some adjacent segment pathology. And I'll just show you what that pathology looks like. If you actually look at the CT scans closely, uh, what you'll see here, um, I wonder if anybody's got a, got a laser pointer, because uh, my mouse is, oh, here's my mouse. Um, and what you see here is, is the, the superior articular facet, you know, here at the 3-4 and at the 2-3, the superior articular facet at both of those levels is, is really encroaching on that foramen. And again, this is sort of the ideal example where we say, well, that's an up-down stenosis, so we'll, we'll uh, get that decompressed indirectly with our, with our anterior. And, um, and, and, and we get some of that with, with some anterior distraction. I usually say I like to have at least six millimeters of posterior height on my uh, A-lifts. This is actually, actually done through a direct lateral. But in my hands, I'm, I'm almost always taking out that facet joint completely for two reasons. One, I get a better decompression. And two, if I don't take out that facet joint completely, I'm not getting the restoration of lordosis that I want. And that's a big part of my goal as well. So anyway, that's an area I think that's worth, uh, worth talking about when we think about inner body fusion. Oh, thanks. thanks a lot, Judy. When we th talk about inner body fusion, that's something that's, that's really worth thinking about. I'm going to wrap things up soon, but uh, you know, the idea of, of how to get... Uh, to, to the spine through an anisoas or through a transoas approach. I think that there are advantages and disadvantages to each. I think you know, th this anisoas, uh, uh, oftentimes there's a nice fat plane here that we can get into that space uh, quite nicely. As long as the neurovascular bundle is posterior, um, I, I tend to uh, do a lot of work through the psoas, and I'll tend to split the psoas uh, uh, as minimally as I can and, uh, and, and work through the psoas. Um, but I'm also, uh, I think it's important to be able to get uh, anterior to psoas, especially down low, uh, uh, three, four, and four, five. I think it's important to access the anterior to psoas. And, and, and uh, John and others will show some, uh, uh, some further examples of this, but recognizing you know, our safe zone. Generally, when I'm going anterior to psoas, I'm typically working in from the left side. I, I'm really uh, uh, equal between left and right if I'm going trans psoas. Um, but I think uh, you know, finding a safe uh, interval to get to the spine is awfully important. And if the spine looked like this, uh, then we really wouldn't have any trouble at all with uh, anterior to psoas, trans psoas, or direct anterior. But in fact, you know, what we're really looking at is this, um, you know, the combination of recognizing our neural and vascular uh, uh, structures uh, that can uh, impede our uh, approaches to the inner body space. So, so I'm going to wrap up with just one more case example here. This is something I did recently. This is a 68-year-old woman. Um, she actually presented to our, our general trauma service. She had swelling in, in her left wrist and a lot of pain in her wrist. She had long-standing back pain, but in the last 48 hours, her back pain and wrist pain were getting worse. This is a, kind of a bad story. She had fevers, uh, 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 labs consist with infection, you know, elevated sed rate, left differential on her white count. And um, our general uh, surgery group took her to, uh, to the OR for IND her wrist, and she had uh, staph aureus growing out of her wrist, and uh, had this back pain, but she had a BMI of 43, couldn't get her into the MRI scan, uh, and uh, that actually, unfortunately, delayed uh, for almost three days the uh, workup of her, of her back pain. So basically the general uh, the ortho group was kind of working on this, thought the back pain was kind of more chronic. And then when she finally got her MRI scan, this is where I got called. As you can see, she's got epidural abscess that extends from the cervical spine, thoracic spine, and all this in lumbar spine. It's one of the worst, worst cases that I've seen. So, uh, so you know, as a typical, I tend to get called about this about nine o'clock at night on a Friday. And uh, so, Anybody else had that experience, right? <laughs> yeah. So we went, went to the, I went to the OR on a Tuesday for the IND of the wrist, and uh, how much nicer it would have been to take care of this. On a, anyway, uh, so, so I, I ended up, uh, this is what, what the lumbar spine decompression looked like afterwards, but this was the nidus of, of the infection. So I, I took out that disc at the time of the decompression, and then I, um, you know, at that time I was decompressing cervical thoracic lumbar, so I didn't end up fusing that. But I went back, and, and I'll just show you that uh, this isn't exactly MIS, but what I want to show you is this is four weeks later. Um, this is four or five here, so I'm, I'm retracting the, um, uh, the common iliac vessels here. 
And, and after the infection, this is kind of scarred in a little bit. So what I'm showing you here is I'm using a cob to kind of peel back on the psoas. So I'm kind of working in this oblique interval here uh, between four or five, and I was going to fuse four, five, and five, one. So what was particularly nice here about uh, uh, using this camber cage is that I was able to put this in sort of obliquely and, and reconstruct that four or five space. And I you know, didn't have to come all the way across the midline uh, to put this in, but rather I kind of worked at anterior to psoas and peeled the psoas back a little bit. And uh, th this, is, this was a video, but just putting that cage in. And this is what that looked like in the end then is, is uh, four, five, and five, one fused. And, and getting this reconstructed. I actually happened to see her back yesterday, and uh, she she is developing some kyphosis across the thoracic spine, but she's actually doing quite well. And uh, she, when I met her, she was uh, essentially obtunded, and now she's got full strength and, and walking. Um, so that that's what that looked like. What well, one more case? So, so that that's where I, I find that the anisoas or the oblique approach, even though that was done open, uh, I really found that useful, especially in some with prior, in this case, infection or some with prior surgery. I find it useful to be able to get to that space uh, from an oblique approach. And here's just one more example of an an anterior approach that I find useful. This is a patient. Uh, 52-year-old uh, who's got progressive deformity involving the, uh, uh, th this lumbar sacral deformity. Th these can be a little challenging here. A fellow named Ibrahim Obed talked about this deformity type where uh, your convexity of that thoracolumbar curve is on the same side as the trunk shift. And these can be a little difficult to correct because if you correct this thoracolumbar deformity too much, uh, that fractional curve, that L4 to S1, tends to be a more difficult curve to correct. So I'm almost, this, this is, uh, Obed calls this an Obed B, or a, a fellow named Bay from Korea uh, calls this a, a, a Bay C type deformity. The point being that uh, I, I like to do these with an anterior and really get L4 to S1, L3 to S1 horizontal. And um, here's what it looks like on the MRI scan. So structural deformity all the way from uh, you know L2, 3 concave, L3 to S1 concave on the opposite side. You see the advanced degeneration in stenosis at 2, 3. And maybe we want to make this interactive. And I've been talking too long. But how do people deal with this? Because I find this a little challenging. Sorry, so on now. Uh, I, I would do this A lifts from L2 down to S1. Um, I haven't had an issue with it. So you don't mind making a big incision like no. I made earlier. You, you were laughing at my big incision there earlier for that post. See, I, I do a lot of my own anterior approaches, so i got to admit my anterior incisions are a little longer than they, they might otherwise be. But in an infection case, yeah, I expose that widely. What One of our mentors many, many years ago taught me, you can't do what you can't see. <laughs> I, I would offer up something different, right? So um, if you look at 4.5 and 5.1, they're pretty much parallel. So I love to stay with a small incision anteriorly and stay really nice and low. So you do your 4-5 and 5-1 ALIF, and then you flip the patient lateral, and either from the right or the left side, wherever you know the rib cage is not obstructing you, you do a lateral there, um, or, or sort of a, an, an oblique uh, OLIF type approach. And then I get these patients up and walking. So the front part takes, I don't know, maybe an hour and 15 minutes. The lateral part takes an hour. Um, and then, so you go in the operating room at 7. By 10.30, they get to the recovery room. By 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I have them up walking. And I look at their leg symptoms. I get them walking the next day with physical therapy, truly put them through the grind with that, with a little brace on, because most of the time they're okay. And then on the next day, I take them back for percutaneous hardware in the back. And they go home the day after. And how often are you perking the back? I mean, you get up a walk and you see that the radicular pain gets better. So I showed you in Dean Chow's series, three quarters of those he ended up yeah. opening up. Yeah, I think there's a difference with what you do in the front. So I use integrated hardware, and I believe strongly not just in the decompression, but also the stability you create. So my lateral cages, oblique cages, I put a plate on also. Um, integrated with the hardware, because I think there's two components that help. The elevation in the foramen and your sort of, you know, your skill to get a decompression done of the foramen, since I think you can look back there. Um, and stability you create, even in a tight foramen, allows the nerve to tolerate that residual pressure. I think if you are floating around still on an interbody cage that doesn't have, you know, the nice spiral hoops and so on, that sort of has a cleat-like connection to bone, you have still an amount of instability that makes these people uncomfortable when they get up and walk. Yes. If you create greater stability in the front, those nerves can tolerate a lot more, pre more uh, residual pressure. 
So, so two approaches, L2 to S1 uh, with an ALF, uh, single uh, incision, same day surgery, stage surgery, which, which certainly we're seeing a lot of now. So staged with uh, two positions in one stage, followed by a posterior percutaneous. Who else? Well, me, I, I find me, this challenge. Yeah, and I, let I, me just I, make one more yeah. comment on the staged. One of the things that we have to be careful with is comparing apples to oranges. There's a lot of series of staged cases out there that are being labeled as degenerative scolies, but they're very mild curves, one or two levels, and that's completely different than a four level that, that we're seeing here. And we just, and in fact, I'm presenting this at the Brussels Spine Meeting later this week. Uh, we just reviewed 175 of my staged cases, and the numbers are pretty similar to Dean's numbers. 30% of mine uh, I converted to PERC when I planned open initially. Uh -huh. So I'm looking at it the opposite way. I plan uh -huh. all of them open. How many did I go to PERC? Uh -huh. And 30% of them went to PERC screws during the stage. Yeah, still 70% you're, you're yeah. decompressing, yeah. Yeah, John, I'd love to hear your take on this. Try and avoid the morbi uh, morbidity of the big exposure. So yeah. we're doing a single position, and we will, uh, because in our place, uh, just transitioning from a uh, supine to an oblique takes over an hour, so it's just too long. So we will make our incision at 5-1 almost like an ALIF uh -huh. in a uh, lateral position, but it's a little bit more lateral, so where the rectus and the uh, uh, oblique join, that's where the uh, exposure goes, so you can put in an anterior cage there, and then we do small little uh, in portals, and I've got a picture of a, one we did recently for the other levels. So three, four, four, five will be done as an oblique. Uh -huh. And uh, we're now doing more laterals at L12 and 23 because if the rib is crossing the disc space, we'll just take a little bit of a rib resection and then we uh -huh. put our uh, 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 retractor there. And for the most part, we're staying in retroperitoneum, but at the thoracolumbar junction, we will uh, sometimes get into the chest and have to put in a, a small tube. Yeah. Um, most of the deformities I see are not like you're seeing. And when, when you see on the CT scan or the MRI that you have so much translation where the spiriticular process is into the foramen, so mm -hmm. that's one that probably won't distract open. Uh -huh. uh, so um, Pimenta talks about if the facet joints are fairly, you know, mild to moderately degenerative, they will open up nicely. Um, and a lot of times, not a lot, sometimes I will actually take burrs and release the backside like you would do, say, for a disc replacement where you've got to release the backside or from an oblique, the opposite side, so it's going to move and distract. Yeah. Yeah, so, so this is what John's pointed out is uh, rather than, as Keith said, uh, two positions with the anterior, right, is a, uh, Keith, Keith had talked about uh, uh, repositioning, so ALIF four to one or, or ALIF five one only, and then uh, two to four lateral. John talked about going to anisoas with a lateral to rectus approach for five one, which which uh, uh, ends up being like an ALIF uh, between the bifurcation, and then going uh, antisoas at uh, to two to two to five. And that way, there's a single stage anterior, and still obviously repositioning for a posterior. So I, I bring up this example because in my hands, it's pretty. Straightforward, you know, a, a four to one, I'm typically doing with an ALIF. I like getting lordosis there. I like taking down the ALL completely. Um, when I've got uh, two to four, one to four, I'm typically doing with either an antisoas or direct lateral. When you got to get down to five one, so often uh, people advocating uh, uh, a lateral approach or an antisoas approach are ignoring five one, right? Either doing a T lift at five one or doing something that's not creating lordosis at five one. So, um, so anyway, I, I like the NSOS approach for this. This is one I actually did uh, similar to, whoop. I guess that was Michael telling me I'm done. Uh, all right, but it is, I, I ended up uh, basically doing what, what, what Izzy said, is uh, I, I did the supine uh, uh, two to one. I, I'm able to, to, to do that, but it's not always easy to get to two, three. I was gonna say that Izzy, Izzy might be one of the few people who do, do that two, three, but usually, usually we can get two, three. So I went two to one anterior, got that nice distribution lordosis and restored her alignment. 
Um, well, well, one quick question, Sig. Um, anything special you do in the positioning to get that lordosis? Do you put something underneath their back, under their yeah. sacrum? Do you tell the nurses, no, 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 don't put that pillow underneath their knees? Yeah, because that's, that's a, what they typically a, try to do, right? That's to make a the great question, Keith. I'm glad you're bringing that up. And, and uh, you know, I, I kind of have this debate that maybe we'll, we'll do uh, uh, subsequently uh, in some of the discussion. But you know, where do I slightly favor, quite honestly, an ALIF over an OLIF? And I know we've got a lot of people here who are great at the OLIF. Is, uh, taking advantage of gravity, right? So I'll actually hyperextend the table. Um, I used to use a, 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 a saline bag or an inflatable bag on a lumbar spine. I don't do that anymore. I just, you know, just extend the table. I'm taking advantage of gravity. I'm cutting my ALL completely uh, at every level, and, and that helps a lot. And but I think supine positioning, uh, taking advantage of gravity, makes sense. And I'll I'll hyperextend over a table, and you know, literally, when sometimes when I cut the ALL, it, it, you'll almost hear a snap um, be, because of that. So, so I, yeah, I, I did this front and back kind of the same day thing and got that distribution lordosis. But I, I, again, I bring this up as ex an example because I think this is a, a, t a tough example for how to do it. So I'm just gonna wrap this up saying that uh, getting inner body fusions is useful for durability of surgery and cost effectiveness. I think for four to one, I really like anterior surgery. Uh, uh, from one to four, uh, I think going lateral or anisoas works well. Uh, in my hands, I much more often need to do four to one, again, because of that gap score. I much more often need to do four to one than I need to do 12 to four, to be honest with you. 12 to four tends to be much more flexible. That four to one curve tends to be much more rigid. And I, th I think we need to do further studies on how to do this uh, efficiently and, and cost effectively. So with that, I'll, as an introduction to the whole spectrum of the inner body approaches from posterior to anterior, I'll give John the mic back. Okay, this talk is actually Dave Rubin's talk, and unfortunately he couldn't be here. Um, Dave's talking about posterior exposures and instrumentation of lumbar spine going back to Harrington. The Harrington rod was a big advance from uh, casting people for deformity, but it had a significant uh, drawback. First of all, it wasn't segmental, and then they tried to get segmental instrumentation with the, uh, the hooks on the side uh, to compress. But it straightened the spine, and it caused lack of lordosis or kyphosing the uh, spine, and then the uh, major breaking breakdown in the distal levels. Oh. Then Eduardo Lucchi came by with the uh, Lucchi rods, which were sublaminar wires to, uh, connected to a rod that gave segmental uh, fixation, but it still had the 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 problem with straightening out the lordosis and the um, uh, inability to derotate the spine, but it was uh, somewhat of an improvement. Then pedicle screws came. Pedicle screws could control the segment in six planes of freedom and was a major advance. Um, initially with the posterior, the rod acted as a tension band and then you put the posterior uh, graft around the rod. So Grafting posteriorly has some problems. Graft is not in compression, which bone likes primarily to heal. In a normal spine, most of the um, load is in the anterior column, about 80% and 20% in the posterior column. As the spine degenerates, that changes a little bit to about 60-40. So, the idea came about to put cages or grafts into the uh, disc space where the bone really wants to heal under compression. Cloward showed us with bone grafts to put into the uh, uh, inner body space. And then in the mid to late, or mid, probably early to mid 90s, we start putting in the cages. Starting uh, with the Ray cage, and then the L, uh, BA cage, and then the LT cage. All of these were passive implants. They're metal and bone likes titanium, but they didn't have any bony ingrowth uh, properties. Uh, they didn't have some of the uh, strain um, properties that we can put implants now into to create a signal for the bone to heal. Then you see um, the harms cage at, uh, in the middle. Um, a lot of these cages depended on the end plate. And if the end plate uh, was compromised in any way, way, either by bad bone or bad surgery, they would subside. They had uh, trouble with uh, non-unions. 
the modulus of these titanium cages compared to bone was also significantly mismatched, so there would be problems with subsidence. Then uh, you see the T-lift cages on the third uh, row, and then eventually um, allograft, milled allografts, threaded allografts to have a better uh, match with the uh, modulus of regular bone. But they were all passive implants. Cortical sc uh, screws made it a little bit stronger. And then while a lot of the cage stuff was going on for anterior approach, they were also being developed for the posterior approach. And it was also at this time that we started to do MIS uh, surgery through tubes. Started off with just doing a discectomy, then doing a laminectomy, then do multiple levels through a single portal, then starting to put in screws, metal, and then implants. So initially these uh, were done as open and then became done uh, uh, minimally invasive, but the whole point was to put something in inner body space to get a circumferential uh, uh, fusion and to help control uh, lordosis. The T-lift came around because it was a less morbid procedure, could be done easily, more easily as a um, MIS approach and it, you could control lordosis. Unfortunately, most of the original uh, grafts were either bone or the metal was not lordotic, or putting in a lordotic cage put your nerve roots at higher risk for injury. So then we had the expandable T-lifts that you see now that are so the, much the rage. But in early designs, most of the expandable cages, the expandable mechanism takes all the room for the bone graft. So there's a high incidence of non-unions. So there are multiple options. The posterior approach has restricted access because of the nerves. And there are limitations into the ability to create lordosis and to get um, surface area for your graft. So there are limitations in training, where you've trained. I think that's not so much of a problem now. Most guys are trained in all the different approaches. Uh, product availability is not much of a problem, but I will tell you, I'm feeling it right now is limitations in your hospital. Um, I never thought about it much being from Dallas where we have lots of anterior access surgeons, but that's not the case in the rest of the country. And access surgeons can be a problem. And so we've tried to develop these techniques where you can do your own access, but there will be um, issues in that uh, in different uh, Ge geographic locations. So they put together a couple cases. The first one is um, a 40 year old lady with uh, back pain as well as claudication. It was noted that at four or five she had a slight slip but mainly a facet cyst causing stenosis. And so his solution was a T-lift. Dave does a lot of MIST lifts, so I'm sure this is a, this is a very valid solution for her. He's, um, it's a little bit um, flat. I mean, he doesn't have a lot of lordosis at 5.1, so segmentally he can Back be a problem. To the first is there another oh, Yes. Yeah, we, there's a little slip there. We call that, my PA is Eric Strouch, and we call it a Strouch slip. If he's the only one who can see the slip, it's by definition, it's a Strouch slip. So it's pretty small, but it is there. And we, I don't have flexion extension views to see if it's uh, dynamic at all. Um, but then we see the, the uh, significant facet cyst here. So the T lift is a or a, a PLIF is a, a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Here, I tend to like to do this uh, as an OLIF. Okay, the second case is a 58-year-old gentleman with pure back pain, no leg pain. This is his plain radiograph. His MRI scan shows transitional anatomy plus significant degeneration, particularly at L5-S1, but also 4-5. These facets are moderately degenerative, but there's still a facet, uh, there's still a joint space here. This is a little bit more regular, but this is the kind of case that from uh, an anterior um, 
approach would probably indirectly decompress this pretty well. So this is one of my cases from the other day. It's a mild degenerative curve. Mainly it's in lumbar. The thoracic is um, uh, more compensatory. Lordosis isn't that much of a problem, but I would like to get more lordosis at four to one. So in this case, this is an intraoperative view of what we have, how we're doing it. So this is a lateral decubitus position. This is the, and these are tissue protectors, which I really like now because they really protect the skin from the retractor blades. And so that looks a lot better post-operatively. All the way to the, uh, um, almost into the, uh, to, the, to the site of the surgery, but they protect the muscles, the soft tissue, and the skin. So it's got a little tag, you put it down, and then you, uh, and it's like one size fits all. So where you see that, that white stuff there, you just roll it up to it touches the skin. And then so the retractor blades go around that. And it really, you know, here you see the retractor there. And it really protects the skin nicely. So here's 5-1. You see that this is the ASIS right here. So this would be traditionally where we do 4-5. So we're going a little bit more anteriorly here. So it sets us up for an A-lift right into L5-S1. So it's a lot easier to deal with the vessels there rather than trying to do an O-lift at 5-1. So this is 5-1. We did both 3, 4, and 4, 5 through this portal, and we're doing L1, 2, and 2, 3 through this portal through just taking a little bit of the rib, about this much. In the past, I tried to go under the rib uh, in, in an OLIF, and it was a little bit more difficult. This is easier. So five levels were done this way through three portals, and I like this because of the morbidity of the anterior approach is so much less. Um, so... Dissection in the retroperitoneal space there. Going lateral, you said you got to take down a bit of the rib. You're doing a second where you're doing that. I still think a midline incision with the patient's supine, you take your rectus muscle laterally, and you get up there, and you're not creating as much damage as those three tissue corridors. I just, I know it's great, and we've done some of these, but I just still think the supine anterior retroperitoneal is not as invasive as everyone makes it seem. Well, I'd agree it's not as invasive, but I think this is a lot better. And I think the morbidity here, they hardly have any anterior pain. The pain they have is from the back and the screws, uh, but it's not from the front. I, I, I don't think an anterior retroperitoneal approach to the rectus has any more pain than that. So, so we, we looked at this, I can comment, because you know, we got 12 people at UCSF doing a, a lot of either the uh, anterior approach. And as Izzy said, going anterior medial to rectus uh, versus going obliquely. And um, <coughs> I will say that there was less postoperative ileus and less postoperative pain in these MIS approaches. So I, I am a, a believer uh, in this. Uh, having said that, the lordosis was better in the patients who were done with an A-lift than patients who were put in a lateral position, and Keith uh, alluded to that with regard to position. Um, but having said that, since we're, so I'm, I'm advocating what you're doing here, John, but maybe just to be a little uh, a, a, a dissenting, is um, at 2-3, well, why go anti psoas on that and take the rib? Why, why not just go direct lateral at 2-3, and then oh, you stay under the rib lateral. better? No, the, I changed it. We were, and when I take a little bit of the rib, I'm doing basically a lateral. Okay. Because yeah. the chance of getting a, a nerve injury up that high is pretty low. Yeah. So it's more lateral there. And that, and that way you can stay a little bit more, more underneath the rib and maybe yeah. not have, it, have to take it as often. Well, it, you know, when we're looking at our uh, fluoro, if the rib is crossing the disc space, then I usually take it. If it's not, if it's one way or the other, I'll go between. Yeah. Um, John, real quick, when you say take the rib, clarify that for people. Yeah. Um, do you take a piece? Yes. Do you dissect it at the base of the rib and no. move the rib? Because I do a lot of trans thoracic ones, mm -hmm. and I don't take the rib anymore. Before, we took a piece of rib out, but I do now I shell it out of the periosteum and basically cut the rib as far back as I can, and then I move it typically south, so I put pressure on the top of the rib where the neurovascular bundle is not present. I leave the soft tissue cuff and the intercostals 
on the superior rib, so that protects my neurovascular bundle, and that's how I get in. So I don't take rib anymore. I used to take it for bone graft, but not taking it and being able to close the chest or close the thoracolumbar junction and put your diaphragm back mm -hmm. actually seems to work better. So I don't take, take bone anymore. Well, we keep the periosteum around, and we just clip the ri we just take a rib cutter, uh, so I don't morselize it. We, well, the exposure uh, surgeon John Chef generally just takes a, just a small piece of the rib and leaves most of the soft tissue intact. I, I still struggle with why have to take the rib? Why have to mobilize the diaphragm or go through the chest? A T9? That's kind of hard. No. Well, no, we're not talking. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no, not a 2-3. We're not in the chest at 2-3. Or, or one, two, what well, one, two, one once in a while. So That's not still, all the time. You still lift the rib up from underneath without having to take that. So in a matter of time, let's move to our panel discussion. Are you, are you done, John? Well, I was just going to show you uh, yeah. the result. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Ah, darn it. Beautiful. Ah. <coughs> it's going. Come on. Okay, so we got pretty much all the, the correction we want, and we're pretty much anatomic both anterior and posterior. Same day surgery? No, we, we staged it. So, yeah, she had a lot of leg pain. I'll re represent you. She had all kinds of stenosis in that curve. Uh, in the, um, in the uh, uh, cavity of the uh, major curve and into the uh, fractional part. And so we uh, went anteriorly, then we had it got up walking the next day, and we had almost all of our correction from the front. And um, so we just per did percutaneous screws uh, posteriorly uh, 48 hours. Come up to because we con we'll continue this discussion. We're going to take some questions from the audience. But I think you can talk while you're coming up. Well, John, you got up to one two there, which uh, Izzy, what, what are you doing at one two? Then you're an advocate of the uh, medial directus, the anterior approach, up to two three. What are you doing at one two? Because I could tell you that two three, I, I'll admit, is difficult, even in, in really experienced hands. One one two, I'm not going to get from the front. Yeah, one one two, you're not going to get from in front, and it's so rare that I have to get to one two. And really, the only times I've had to be at one two is for infections or tumors. And that's a straight lateral approach for me. That, that's a thoracoabdominal type exposure because you got the crust of the diaphragm, you've got vessels. Uh, that's a whole different different area. But that's not the degenerative scoli cases that we're dealing with. Very good. So I've got some questions for people, but if there's questions in the audience, I'd like to hear from you. And by the way, but you're going to hear me coughing and hacking. I did have a COVID test yesterday. I'm COVID negative, happy to say. <laughs> but I, but I, picked up, I picked up a bug on... I picked up a bug on Wednesday or Thursday, so I'm packing so, a little bit. Uh, I have a question no. for the panel because uh, initially when we started to do tea leaf, I remember my mentor, Dr. Holt, went to visit Dr. Harms, and we used to do unilateral tea leaf. We take one facet joint out, and we figured it out. Most of the cases end up with like loss of lordosis and subsidence. But we changed it to do bilateral facetectomy and put two cages, and those actually, we were able to restore the lordosis. I think I want to take the panel approach to see, do you do bilateral tea leaf or still you do unilateral tea leaf? Maybe I'll start with that, Mohammed. Um, and I, some other time I'll tell you about my experience with Dr. Harms after fellowship. I got some spent some time there too, and uh, certainly uh, deserves a lot of credit for what he uh, uh, developed as a tea lift technique. Uh, most often in my hands, I'm doing unilateral because I'm oftentimes using a banana cage, getting that cage up in the front, kind of fulcruming over that cage. Uh, but having said that, if you're using an inline cage. I think bilateral can work really well, and, and uh, definitely ha had some experience with that. I'm almost always taking down both facet joints, um, because otherwise you're really not getting much restoration of lordosis. So I'm always doing a type 2 osteotomy, meaning taking out the, su the inferior and the superior facet at that level. I almost always take down the midline, which is, you know, again, the difference between an MIS approach and an open down approach. If you're not taking down the midline, it's really tough, again, to get much lordosis out of that. Uh, but in my hands, most often I'm using a banana-shaped ca cage in the front and fulcruming over that cage. Uh, and uh, what are you guys doing it bilateral? I, I do very few T lifts. When I do do them, it's typically unilateral with one of the curved cages as well, trying to position it. 
as far anterior and in the coronal plane to, uh, to act as a fulcrum. When, when you approach a, a high-grade slip that's badly degenerative, like Sig showed earlier, Dr. Bourbon showed earlier, I think getting a paddle spinner in bilaterally at the same time helps you mobilize that space, because they can be very rigid. And then still, you're going to do your big exposure unilaterally in place of banana cage unilaterally. But just making a small uh, annulectomy on the contralateral side from your T-lift access, putting a paddle spinner in there can really help you uh, reestablish that space that can be significantly rigid. Mohammed, when you go by that, are you, are you put it in inline cages? I favor that. If I if I weren't going to use a banana cage that I put up in the front, I'd try to get my cage way up by the annulus. If I weren't going to do that, then I would definitely favor, rather than like a posterior oblique, you know, rather than having a single cage going obliquely, I would favor going bilaterally. And I, I have done that in quite a few, usually some bigger patients where I don't need as much lordosis, but I, I, uh, I have done bilateral with some frequency. Any other questions out there? Because you, you guys are all part of this. You're on the podium with cool. us. What, what, what questions do you have? Uh, Jordan Amadio from uh, UT Austin. Um, it, thanks for the talk. You know, I, uh, similar to, to that takeoff on that question is the paradox, as you put it, of uh, compressing posteriorly, um, you know, in case of a T-lift to create lordosis. I mean, this is why, you know, I've moved away from T-lifts. I did a lot in training, and now I rarely do them. But um, it, what do you... Do you do that typically? Do you do you do, you do a lot of posterior compression if you do a T lift? Or yeah, I'll, I'll start with that one again. Is, is if I need to create lordosis, that's where I I'm almost always doing something anterior to create lordosis. And um, um, but I showed you some examples where I can't you can do it with the T lift. But if I really want to create lordosis, I'm usually doing uh, something anteriorly. Or in the case I showed, I, I had intended to do a three column osteotomy actually. Um, but in terms of you got to be real careful with squeeze, you know, with, with compressing posteriorly, right? Because that's how you narrow the foramen. And, and so really, you know, paying attention to that is, is important. So you got to get a lot of anterior height. Um, typically, I've done those with expandable cages. You know, John's bashed the expandable cage. And quite honestly, I don't, I don't use the expandable cage very often anymore. Um, but, but typically, I do that with an expandable cage, get, you know, literally 14 millimeters of height and, and only then compress. I think this notion of op op keeping the frame and open is really important, and I tried to demonstrate that in my case with uh, w w with the uh, direct lateral, where I opened up the frame and I, I still took out the facet joints. I think paying attention to the posterior height of the implant is really important, and maybe this is a brief talk topic we can go through, um, especially if we're thinking about getting hyperlordotic cages. You know, anything more than 20 degrees. Uh, at four five and five one, I really worry about the posterior height of these implants, and, and in general, I'm almost always trying to get at least six millimeters of posterior height in my implant, and and, and specifically, um, you know, if you're creating lordosis and if you're fulcruming on a PLL, then that is going to narrow the foramen, and um, in, in those cases, I'll almost always my my sequence. And I think we might have some time to show some techniques later, but my sequence is to take down the PLL, so I do the complete discectomy, and I'll actually take down the PLL, I'll use a small angle curette, take it off the top of the vertebral body below, and I spend a lot of time getting my posterior distraction first. So I'll get my height first, and I'll literally take my shims uh, and go from a four millimeter shim to a five to a six, get my posterior height first, and then dial in the lordosis. So I think that's a really important order of doing things to as you said, avoid foraminal narrowing, and, and avoiding foraminal narrowing with the ALIF uh, works best if you really get that posterior uh, distraction. Who, who is that masked man that just walked in? Well, well welcome to Dr. Nunley. So, so Nunley's like the mailman, and neither rain nor sleet nor snow will keep him from. Yeah. So, did, did so you fly your own plane? That's what we all want to know. No, I let American do it, which is the problem. I would have been here if I flew my own plane. <laughs> <laughs> so back to the, the, the question. The, the one thing that we keep tending to do is generalize everything. And none of these cases are exactly the same. And if you're worried about posterior foraminal compression issues, 
you've got to do that decompression, but then you also have to get the lordosis. So you've got to plan for every case. It's a patient-specific, level-specific issue when you're looking at all of these things. Now, we talked a little bit about the expandable cages, and, and John, you mentioned earlier that the reason expandable cages are failing is because you can't get the bone graft in there, there's the expandable mechanism. I, I'd maintain that that's not the prime reason. What I'm seeing in the revisions that I see with these expandable cages is poor technique, poor disc space preparation, and individuals are expanding the cage in a tilted fashion, so you're getting point contact instead of flat end plate contact. And what's happening is that you're subsiding the cage at the moment of surgery. Then the individuals are fooling themselves by putting screws in and saying, oh, look at my alignment. They're polyaxial screws. The minute that person stands up, the polyaxial head fails, and they tilt right down. So it, it's a technique issue. It's knowing your implants. It's working meticulously as opposed to coming out and saying, oh, I can do an MIS TLF in 45 minutes. Um, it takes me 30 to 40 minutes just to clean the disc space properly for a TLF. So you've got to look at every case individually. We cannot generalize on these things. That's actually true. We, we did a cadaver work where we um, did what we, we used our typical TLF tools to prepare the end plate, and then we put a endoscope in it to look at it. And I thought, did a great job, I thought it was great. When you actually looked at it, it was terrible. So then we used the, um, the drill, uh, drill to help prepare the end plate, particularly the contralateral posterior side, and it was much better. And then we did some more, not just looking at it with a scope, but actually dissecting the uh, uh, cadaver out, and we could prove that there was much better end plate preparation. So I think, I've said publicly that the TLIF is more of a disease than an operation. It's a very compromised operation in my hands. If somebody doesn't have uh, a, um, a lot of lordosis to create or they're very low um, activity patient, you know, some, somebody older, just to try to keep the morbidity down, do that procedure rather than something anterior posterior or some reason I can't go anterior, I will do a TLIF. But the most of the operation is preparing the end plate. I have a question. Um, actually, some remarks also. First of all, um, with the T lifts. Um, Flip the switch on your mic. Up. I'll just do it louder then. Thanks, Pierce. Um, first of all, um, when guts are doing T lifts, I think part of the issue with lordosis is a lot of the surgeons are not necessarily using anatomic like Jackson table during Wilson that kind of throws that into kyphosis to start off with. And I also agree with the actual aspects of those expandable cages. You got that small footprint on the end plate. Um, there's a lot of driving force that you cut into those areas. And I see a lot of subsidence on the revisions I do. The other question is, is when you try and get that extra lordosis, when you worry about that foraminal height, um, are you doing like maybe SPOs if you put the patient over to get that extra lordosis after you do a lift to get that height, better lordosis, but also to maintain that retinal opening? So, so you're on that spectrum from SPO to complete facetectomy to just taking the superior portion of the superior articular facet off to doing it. And again, every case is going to be a little different. And you've got to study your MRI and CT scan and figure out what are the goals of this surgery. The goals are to decompress centrally, fine. Laterally, fine. Foramily, <laughs> do the decompression. You got to get the alignment. You've got to reduce the listhesis. So you figure out the steps and build from there. Uh, uh, John, I think you're making some really good points, uh, and I'll, I'll be the first to confess, uh, maybe, that I think, first of all, uh, I do my single-level T-lifts on a Wilson frame. I, I flatten the frame. I, um, I always should use fixed-axis screws. I'm going to get back to that fixed-axis screw issue. But to be honest with you, for single-level, I'm doing bilateral facetectomies. I kind of feel like I have enough control over it that I don't necessarily need that Jackson frame, and sometimes... You know, just quite honestly and candidly, um, I, I do a lot of revision decompression work, and I, I, I really love working on nerve roots, but it's just easier for me to, to do it, to put in a T-lift with the patient uh, 
uh, cranked in some kyphosis for single level. I, I'll confess I do tend to do that. I, maybe I shouldn't, but I do tend to do that in Wilson frame for the ease of manipulating the, the nerves. And again, for a single level, I got a lot of control there. Now, now Izzy made a point about using fixed axis screws. And I can't tell you how often I think I should do that. I, I only use fixed angle screws. Pretty much I use it at the convexity of my thoracic scoliosis cases, which we probably won't talk about a lot today. Um, and sometimes I use it in my high grade spondies. But other than that, I almost never used a fixed axis screw. And I Tell me about uh, Yeah, so I, I've been using fixed head screws for, for years because of the control that you can get with it. Uh, and I'm kind of the opposite of you. Uh, the time I use polyaxials is when I'm doing perk screws because there isn't a good fixed head perk screw system that, that's, that's out there that, that works well. The only other time that I'm now using polyaxles, and actually it's a lot more than I used to, uh, is because of the fenestrated screws and cementing them. I'm cementing a lot more of my screws. It's probably more a reflection of my patient population with the osteoporosis and the deformities. Uh, but in general, for the fixed axis screws, you get much better control. And mm -hmm. to, to, not to, or just to reemphasize the point, if you are doing a single level uh, you put your fixed axis screws in first, you contour your rod, you distract against those rods. As you're distracting, you're getting more lordosis automatically. Then you can decompress what you need to decompress, do your T-lift or plifts, and then let things settle onto the cage, and you've got it under control again. So, so, th so for T10S1, you're using fixed axis screws the whole way? If I'm doing open, yeah. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be a little critical here because I think that's, this is a friendly enough group here um, that I'm going to say, number one, you get a, the reason you have to cement in your screws is because you're probably pulling them all out of that osteoporotic bone to try and get that fixed screw to yeah. a rod. And, uh, Absolutely, I'm pulling them out, but now it, that I cement them, I don't pull them and out. And just, you know, that, that, that Izzy's so darn smart that, that he's going to bully everybody. So, so I'm going to... So, so, uh, and, and, also, and also, without a robot... Can you really do that without a robot to get those screws to line up? <laughs> so I, I don't know. I've been ro using a robot for 20 <laughs> okay. years now, so I don't even know that I can put a screw in freehand <laughs> anymore. Um, I, I, it's hard to use fixed axis screws from T10S1. It really is hard. It is hard. There's no doubt about but it. But on the, on the levels that you really want to control, I have to admit, I should use more fixed axis screws on the levels you really want to control. And I, I just don't because... Yeah, I just don't. And I'd have to, I'd have to agree with Sig too, because I, I, you know, you're, you, you gotta, you gotta play to all surgeons, not just the super type A's with, uh, with robots. I mean, and even with a robot, I'll tell you that you're not, you still have issues with insertional points, and so you know, trying to pull everything to that rod is uh, most surgeons need the polyaxality to not have loss of fixation, uh, and most surgeons. Um, and I think that maybe easy you could train folks to do that, but I think even, again, uh, not talking to anybody in this room, but, you know, it's... it's well, no, there's a well, reason why well, we moved from monoaxial screws to polyaxial screws. There's a good reason for that, and so, but there's a place for everything. And, uh, any other questions from the audience for this panel before we move? Um, just one quick perk, right? I mean, I, I'm so happy that we don't just talk about implants. We talk about technique and how to do the right thing. And to six point, right, to get this posterior height, if you're an A-lift surgeon um, and you don't have one, but try to get a hold of the old David spreader that came with the Charité because there is nothing better than just, you know, doing your discectomy to an extent that you can put the device in there. You crank it very gently. And you get this satisfying pop in the back. And then you can basically do your A-lift like an ACDF. And I think it's a much better operation, especially when you have these coronal deformities with these large footprint um, end plate coverage devices. And then usually I pop it that way, and then I put a small skinny like synthes distractor in there to do my discectomy. I really do an ACDF at the back of the L5 and uh, S1 and L45 disc. So I, I've got a couple of questions here. I'll try to make this quick, but uh, in case you might take this one. Um, I'm a big believer in posterior distraction, starting with soft tissue development and then implant placement. 
My concern is um, recently I feel like if I put a massive cage in up front and I get it too far posterior, all of a sudden I find myself fighting to get the lordosis I'm looking for. If, my, if I put a massive cage up front and I get it way in the back of the disc, disc base, I struggle to get the lordosis I'm looking for. And so I, I guess my question is, can we put in a cage that is too big anterior to posterior? And are you working to put that large a lif o lif or l lif cage, are you working to put it in the anterior portion of the disc base behind the ALL? Or where, where, where are you working to place that cage to both get foraminal decompression as well as lordosis? I think the posterior height of your disc is crucial, right? So if I put a 20 or 25 degree cage in there, because beyond that is, is almost never, right? Let's be honest. I mean, people put in 35 degree cages. I, I, don't, I don't, you know, uh, that doesn't make sense to me. Um, so if you put a 20 or 25 degree cage in there, um, I think doing a decompression posteriorly by taking the, the PLL and sometimes doing a true frame anatomy with like curved kerosens or so, like you do an ACDF, is crucial. And then it needs to be tall in the front. So the smallest 20 degree cage I put in is probably a 19. Because if you do anything less, your posterior piece is so small that you automatically will squeeze them down in the back. So put them as far enough back as you can. Have trials that match your implant, as opposed to putting a 16 millimeter in there and then putting a 19 degree uh, or a 19 millimeter cage or so in there. Um, and don't be shy of getting a lateral X-ray. Um, and I flew. I put an inflatable arterial line back underneath the sacrum actually. So instead of bending the table, I do it on a flatboard Jackson, and I put an inflatable arterial line back underneath the sacrum, and I can increase and decrease it if need be. But I crank these people over a bump, and then typically you get enough distraction in the front as opposed to squeezing them in the back. So when you say you put them over a bump, you're talking about traditional uh, A-lift? Traditional A-lift, yeah, yeah, traditional A-lift. Yeah, I find it, if I really need lordosis, I am a better surgeon doing an A-lift than an O-lift. I have a hard time not having the biomechanical advantage of that supine positioning yeah. with an olive if I really need to get an You're not alone in that. Anterior height. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, thoughts I think, on I think placement? you know, so I choose um, the implant based on what I'm trying to do. So if, if, if it's a 5.1 and I think a 15 degree is going to fit it perfectly, that's fine because uh, I want to maximize uh, what we were talking about earlier, the, the implant to in-plate surface area. But... If I'm needing to get a little bit more and I really need to get some more lordosis, I'll go to the next angle height up, leaving me some room in the back, like you were saying, John, so that I can, uh, from the backside, compress across that if that's enough. Or as Izzy was saying, um, maybe I have to do a minimal decompression all the way up to an SPO. And I agree with you on the heights. The only time I use more than a 20 degree is when I'm going to do something like a true SPO posteriorly, and I'm really needing to do something like an ACR type of procedure. But you can't, you can't get that without significant facet destruction. Uh, you will not obtain those angles. Um, so anybody that puts a 26 degree in and says, oh, I'm going to get 26, if they don't do anything to the facets in the back, no, you're not. This is not going to happen. And, and you just made the surgery worse. You're, you're hoping for something better, and you just made the surgery worse, and you increase your chances of subsidence. Yeah, so I'll add to that. Pierce was in travel when I was showing that I really am pretty aggressive about taking out the facet joints above and below. And uh, what I wanted to add to that is oftentimes I'll just have fixation in my cage. So if I've got uh, uh, integrated screws, I'll have fixation only on one side of that cage because if you fix it on both sides, you're kind of locking yourself in. So I'll just put two screws in one end plate, and then I'll, I'll um, take out my facet joint. That gives me a little more flexibility so I'm not locking the end plates uh, from the front. Oh, and, and I'm going to share this technique too. This, you can do this with any system. If you have a, um, if it is a spondy and I want to do something posterior and I'm doing an A-lift, I'll, I'll fixate one side. Um, but uh, actually, the Enza doesn't allow you to do this because uh, as of now, it's, it deploys both, both sides. But if you use a screw type of interface and it's a loose spondy, you can put the two screws in the cranial vertebra and then a lot of times tap on the inserter and actually reduce it, then throw your lower screw in. Uh, that, that can work if you've got good bone and good fixation.
Yeah, Sig showed a case of exactly that. Oh, That's, sorry, uh, one here. <laughs> so uh, before we transition to the next segment, I'd like a quick comment from each member of the panel on this subject of anterior posterior. When you've done your anterior work, you reposition the patient posterior. Are you doing perk screws with mini open to do your facet mobilization and or decompression? Or are you doing traditional open with open screws? So can we just comment quickly? Are you doing perk screws with mini open to do your posterior work? Or so if I don't open? need any realignment, I'll go perk. But if I need decompression or realignment, I'm, I'm virtually always doing that open. Traditional open. Traditional open. Easy. So as I mentioned, we just looked at uh, all of my staged cases, and about 30% of them are going to perk screws only. When I'm perking the screws, I'm also doing percutaneous facet decortications with that. So I'm getting a complete fusion, a circumferential fusion front and the facets from Are behind. you still trying to take the facet out to mobilize no, it or just, no, I, just I decorticating the, it? I drill the facet out through it through a tube, essentially. I place the tube right over top of the facet, have an eight millimeter reamer that just goes right down coaxial with it, the yeah. facet, and then fill the facet joint with bone. Is it, if it's not staged, then do you have the confidence to go perk in the back? It depends on the patient. Sometimes, you know, I've got some young patients and you look at their CT scan, they've got a little foraminal stenosis, but like you said, if I get that posterior disc height above six millimeters, I'm pretty comfortable. And in that individual, I'm very comfortable telling them, you know what, we're going to try it perk, but I may have to come back and do a foraminotomy on you at some point. So let's take this step first. Dr. Peloza? If I'm staging and they don't have any leg pain and I've got good correction already, then I just perk the screws. I'm counting on my inner body to get me in my uh, fusion. Um, if you need to do something posterior then, do you perk the screws and do mini open? Or do you do traditional open? Well, if I'm just, I do, if I'm going to put, do, do something with a fusion, I do it just through a tube there too. I have done um, the osteotomies through a tube as well, but it takes too long. So if you've got somebody, you've got to uh, go quicker, then I'll make a mini uh, exposure where I'm going to do my osteotomy and decompression, like in the midline, and get both sides real quick, uh, and then perk the screws. Yeah, gotcha. And, and I'll actually, uh, if it's just one level, um, will and I need to do an SPO. Uh, I'll I'll actually do that through the Wiltsy approach, and uh, but I don't do it through a tube. Sorry, I, I'll put it in a retractor so I can really see it, and and work up and just drill out to end uh, across from both sides. Good. I don't, I don't want to be, be the one who's always critical, but I, for both John and Pierce, this, this is rubbish. This idea this idea of doing it. And, and, and he called me too. the bully for for your for. <laughs> And, and, and for John Williams, too. And, so, you know, somebody's got to call this out a little bit. This idea of doing a, a Wiltsy approach, doing a minimal facetectomy, doing a mini open, it's, it's bullshit because you've got to take down the interspinous ligament. You're not getting anything without taking down the interspinous ligament on these older patients. It's like a Bostrop's disease. So unless you're taking down the midline, you're not going to get lordosis. I thought I said I did that. From the uh, midline. You did, midline you did it from approach. the midline. You, you, All right. Pierce, go yeah, on, go you, on. you can actually reach a burr up and out, and you can do that from both sides. It's, it's, if I'm, if I'm uh, going to just do one level and that's all I need to do, and I don't need to do a lot, yes, you can. It's not easy. All right, so, so if anybody believes that Pierce is taking that time in a surgery center, then that's fine. But the point I'm making, <laughs> that, the, the, the point I want to make is that you've got to take down the interspinous ligament to get that lordosis. And this whole idea of what we're doing percutaneously We'll, we'll, we'll be a little critical about some of these x-rays, but I hope you all will spill, speak up, too, because at some point, you've got to call this out, and at some point, you've got I'll to keep down the midline. So I think yes. what works really well is just do a three-incision technique. Right? I really like to converge my screws a lot, so I have not shy at all to make two Wiltsy planes far lateral, like, I don't know, 10 centimeters lateral or so, based on the size of the patient, right? And then I make a little midline incision, and I tell the patient you'll have three incisions, and I do the right work through the midline, easy with two gelpies or, you know, whatever. You don't have to do it through a tube. But you can still put your screws in from very far lateral. And the bigger the patient, the greater that advantage is, I think, because you still keep the longitudinal structures alive, but you can, to six points, still do a good operation through that center. And that's not much of a deviation for what you do now. So, again, we're, we're generalizing. And, and what you pointed out was the broad spectrum of patients that we're seeing. And we're trying to do the same thing for every single patient. That's just not the case. Every patient is different, and we've got to 
pick the right tool at the right time and the right technique to address the neurological issues, the stability issues, the alignment issues, the bone density issues. There's all those things that we have to consider here. Agreed. Agreed.